when I was should have joined the army, I was in the Isle of Man. So I went for my medical there, and it being the Isle of Man, they said I was unfit for military service in the categories one, two, three, or even four A because of my eyesight. So I came back home, and uh, I went to a job with the ICI. It bored me to tears, so I came back. A friend of mine had been in the education corps in the army. So I thought, I just wonder what would happen. So I went into the army recruiting office, and a day later I was ready to actually join the army. There was one slight snag when they put me in front of the reading board, and they said, well, what's the letters? I said, well, sorry, I can't see any. No, he says, the top letter. Sorry, sir, I can't read that either. Well, put your bloody glasses on then. <laughs> So I uh, put my glasses on, read right down to the bottom of the board, and that was marked down medically as A1, forward everywhere. I had a friend, Rhys, who joined in the army, and he'd been in the Education Corps uh, for his national service. So when I went, I said specifically that I wanted to be in the Education Corps. No problem at all. And uh, when I was called, in November 51, I went down to the Queen's Regiment in, in uh, southern England and did my, started my basic training with them. And after four or five days, they said, you're going to Canterbury. Yes, sir. You're in the potential leaders platoon. Yes, sir. So I went to Canterbury and it was a ten-week course rather than a six-week. And at the end of four or five weeks, I was in, told to go and see the colonel, who said to me, well, you know perfectly well that you can't get a commission because you have not got a degree. So I said, yes, sir. Well, why don't you try something like the engineers? I asked to go in the army into the education course, sir, and I want to stick with it. Well, all right. So that was it. And then from there, I went to Beaconsfield and near London and did the six month training as an education corps sergeant. It's very nice because I've been in the army for about 10 weeks and I got three stripes then on my arm. That was that time, I'm now digressing into personal matters, but it was at that time that I met my future wife and uh, when uh, I got a posting, which I did, it was to the Army Apprentices School in Chepstow and did a year there uh, as a single man and then married Doreen and we got a flat overlooking Chepstow Castle. What we were doing was training uh, boy soldiers uh, to join various units within the army. It was an Army Apprentices School. And um, it seemed very successful. I got on quite well. They thought I should try and get some of the idiots who passed their GCE. And I got about an 80% pass rate, which uh, uh, pleased me no end. Um, after that, after a year there, as a married man, I got posted to Jamaica came back to Beaconsfield for onward movement and I was called in and said uh, there's a man here whose child has got one child and his wife is about to have another one your posting has been changed he's got your posting you've got his and his is to Korea uh, didn't worry me and Julie, didn't worry Doreen unusually because she was perfectly capable, had for years managed for herself anyway. This would be November 51 when I joined, 53, November 53, end of, end of 53. And so I went to Southampton, got on board the Empire Ferry and we sailed to Korea. Well, we didn't. We sailed to Japan, first of all, to Kure. Uh, very nice journey because I got uh, uh, sailed through the Mediterranean, 
Stopped off at Aden and had a day wandering around there. Stopped off at Colombo, the same. Stopped off at Singapore and Hong Kong. And then I got to Cure and we had a fortnight at Cure before we, uh, in, that's Japan, until we went to Busan in Korea. And from Busan, uh, we went by train up to Rear Divisional Headquarters where I discovered what I was doing. The army produced a newspaper called Crown News and it produced it on Gestetner machines and distributed them to the troops every day, Sundays included, no matter where they were. So if they were in what you call it the front line, and the hostilities had ceased, but it was still an uncomfortable time and we delivered the newspaper so that the lads kept up the times. And that was my job for the next year. Korea was a very different sort of setting to, uh, to what I'd been in civilization before. And Korea was an astonishing place then. Seoul was mud streets and the tallest building was one story high. Um, most of the land when you looked around was either bare mountains or scrub. And where it was cultivated in any sense, it wasn't fields in our sense, it was paddy fields. Step after step after step of paddy fields. Uh, I was first posted, as I say, to the, the Crown News, which is at Rear Divisional Headquarters. And then they moved Rear Divisional Headquarters. Um, the Americans had planned a better site for us. They got the side of the hillside and bulldozed four platforms on it. And the top platform was the one where our concert was, which concert is the American version of the Nissan Hut. And there was a strange situation because we were on active service, and yet the only active service we really saw was when we went out with the delivery jeep taking the Crown News copies to the front line. Or what passed for front line to the forward troops. And because of the strange situation there, the driver had to have somebody with him carrying a Bren gun, not a Sterling, a Bren gun, with the instructions that if anyone tried to stop you, you shot them. <laughs> you didn't, uh, and no questions would be asked. Unfortunately, I went a few times, although I was a senior member by that time, a staff sergeant, and uh, I went out just for the fun of it, for the interest of it, but uh, it was it, it was a genuine job. Of course, the other people who caused us problems and who actually stole jeeps, yeah, a complete jeep, was the South Korean police. And they would steal a jeep, quite often over a six-foot wire fence. They'd use poles to mount the fence, poles to get underneath the jeep, carry the jeep over and carry the jeep over the wire fence whilst the Americans slept in the American camp. Next morning the jeep would be in the police headquarters being painted blue. Um, the other, I suppose, you know, life was just full of strange differences. Uh, one of the first differences that I noticed because I went there in the winter time was at the start of the uh, Korean winter. Uh, we lived in concerts which were heavily lined. At first puzzled me a little bit as to why there was such a heavy lining that I found out. Um, you, you put a glass of water beside you and went to bed. And when you woke up in the morning, it was a lump of ice in the inside. So I, this morning I, I uh, opened the door and went to walk outside. My foot went through the ground about six inches deep. And what had happened over the whole area is the water in the ground had frozen. It had frozen so quickly it had no time to move other than up. So it rose up in spikes and the top layer of soil rested on the spikes. Um, You got very used to it because we had the right clothing. I feel very sorry for the first of our soldiers who went and had to live with tropical clothing because some idiot in the war office hadn't realised that Korea wasn't tropics. Um, 
but by the time I got there, we had boots and all, all sorts of gear. In the, the Nissen Huts concerts, the only form of heat we had was a tank with a chimney at one end and a carburetor at the other, into which we dripped petrol and then lit it. There was, shortly after I, re I arrived, there was one time when somebody went up they'd had a, a good time and got themselves totally drunk. Went up, turned the carburetor on, then couldn't find the matches. This is what we worked out. And then, uh, the time he did find the match, the thing was half full of petrol, he threw a match in and the whole thing went up. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> we didn't. Have, again, the man was stupid because we didn't bother. We never did anything like that. We had Korean servants. Oh, we just chipped in a little bit of our pay and gave them bits of American dollars. They wouldn't do anything at all. We never let. Uh, I never, uh, never washed my own socks when I was there, and a very comfortable life actually. I had the the job to do, but that was no great uh, difficulty. We used to listen to the radio and get the news off the radio. My job, because I was the staff sergeant, was to manage the whole process. I suppose you could call me the director. Uh, we had a captain. I used to see him about once a week. Uh, God knows what he did else other times. Um, I had an Australian, a New Zealand, and a Canadian sergeant as editors for their own pages and a British one whose job was to do the sports page, nothing else but the sports page. And yet another British one who had to do the British news. So the Australians and Canadians and New Zealanders had one man had to do news and sport. We had three, uh, which, all right. Uh, all the hard work was done by the gooks, the Koreans. Um, they would, they would wind the gestetten. It was all done on hand gestetteners. I mean, they, they wrote the ones where you rotate them by hand. And they thought nothing of it, no problem at all. And what's more, after they'd been there for a little while, if the gestetner went wrong, they had it to pieces, put it back together again, and got it working. And I suppose that was my first glimmer that the Koreans had something between the ears, which a lot of the world hadn't appreciated. They learnt and they learnt fast. Um, apart from that, there were the, 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 an amusing story, if you like, of the Jeeps and the, um, the Austin Champ. Thank you, yes. Uh, in the summer, the Austin Champ was a menace because it was heavy. If you took it off the road, it probably sunk up to its axles. So you kept it on the road. Jeeps were lighter, and if it did sink, they were so light that you could pull it up fairly easily. In the winter, the situation reversed. To keep the Jeeps from freezing, to keep it so that they made them work at all, the Americans had chains of petrol tanks lit and stored the Jeeps inside this circle of lit, pe lit petrol tanks. Damn dangerous, but... Whilst I was there, no one actually died from one. The point about the winter time was extremely cold, and I said the Americans couldn't get the Jeeps to work unless they kept them in a heated enclosure. The Austin Champ had a button. When you press the button, an electrical element heated the cylinder. But when you press the starter button, the thing started straight away. The champ would work in the deepest of Korean winters, no problem at all, which the Americans were extremely jealous of. And it being the strange situation it was, the British brigadier rather fancied having a helicopter, which the Americans had several of. And the exchange rate, I think, I think it was six champs to one, one helicopter. Um, and there were a number of helicopters which uh, a mere colonel could uh, find himself sharing a helicopter. Um, social life was very strange because the British mess and the Canadians and the American messes 
They were all army messes in a foreign country and ready for trouble, but not really very ready because there was no trouble. So it was one, in many ways, a long holiday. We didn't do any drill or anything like that. Even the private soldiers didn't do any drill. There was no, there wasn't a drill ground, there wasn't a parade ground. So uh, people just kept themselves amused. When we moved to the second concert, the one on the third layer up the hill, and you climbed up with a set of wooden stairs, um, we had an Australian who was called Curly, um, who did enjoy, uh, wasn't really the right, uh, they didn't have Fosters, and therefore as an Australian he had to pain of drinking something different, but he drank a lot, lot of it. Uh, on this occasion, we were going up the wooden stairs, got to the top level, and Curly stopped and said, no good, I've got to. So he went to the edge of the terrace to relieve himself. And he was so totally drunk that he fell over, fell into the next terrace, whilst we raced down as fast as we could, thinking of the worst. And there was Curly with his Australian bush hat wrapped round his face, stopping the mud from getting to him, and with his legs waving in the air, and a muffled noise underneath, which when we took the hat off him was not to be repeated. <laughs> um, didn't do him any good, he, he kept on drinking just as much. He didn't actually fall off the terrace, I think he learned to stand back a bit. Whatever. During your, we did 12 months. During your 12 months, you got a journey to uh, Tokyo. You were given a week in Tokyo, which was very pleasant. Uh, flew with the Yanks, they, they, they flew us over. Funnily enough, the thing which sticks most in my mind is not the actual time in Tokyo, although that was fascinating, well worth it. It wasn't the journey over in the big American plane, I don't ask me what model it was, I couldn't tell you. It was the American mess. Now we lived in the typical army mess, you know, bread and butter pudding and that sort of thing. They had five flavours of ice cream to choose from. And the whole, I mean, God knows how many sauces, if you went and you had meat, you know, for your main meal, you had a choice of three, four, five different sauces. They're living, oh, and fresh milk every day, by the way. Every day fresh milk. We, in our quarters, never knew what fresh milk was for the whole year. Um, on the way out to Korea, we stopped, as I said, on the, the ship, stopped at Aden and had a look there. We stopped at Colombo and there, and Singapore and, and um, Hong Kong. On the way back, we just reversed the procedure. We stopped at Hong Kong and had a day there and a day there and a day here. And I got, uh, I mean, went through the Suez Canal. I got to Port Said on the Suez Canal and they was called in to see the OC. And they said, Staff, I've got a man here who cannot be allowed to fly home. And yet it's essential that he gets home as soon as possible because of his family needs. Would you mind, uh, you can, if you like, appeal against it, but would you mind if we put you off shore uh, to wait for the plane? <laughs> no, sir. Uh, I saw no reason why I should. In fact, I might even have got home the day before then. As it was, I think I got home just about the same day that the ship did. Um, then I got home. Uh, had my four, five weeks of holiday due, or was it six, whatever. <coughs> and then got my posting to Carlisle, to the camp run by the 11th Hussars, which was a basic training unit. And I ran the education, well, you know, I had a major running the education centre, but Major Ray just said to me, uh, if you really need something, ask me, but I probably don't know the answer either. And we had that relationship, which is very comfortable. And I spent three years there. And at the end of the three years, I was posted to 
Minden in Germany. Well, I was posted, I didn't know where. I got to the barracks eventually, and uh, I was informed that it was Minden. And arrived at Minden, very pleasant. I was then in the, again in an education centre, a bigger one. I think we had 12 National Service sergeants in it. Um, after about three months, I found that it was quite possible to get your family over. You didn't need to have a quarter. You could find a room in a hotel even. So I did. I found a room in one hotel. I got Doreen over and Susan. Um, by that time, we had a two-and-a-half-year-old. A uh, very pleasant hotel. It was right on the, beside the bridge. The only thing about it was that the milk wagon used to wake us up every morning, coming by with the churns clanging against each other. So I looked for another location. Um, there was a, a, a big hill near us with a statue on top of it. It was very much a tourist attraction, uh, recalling the Battle of Minden. I looked around there, because by that time I had acquired a car. Uh, changing topics. The car was a Mercedes-Benz. Um, soldiers could afford the Mercedes-Benz. Um, petrol cost us fractions of what the Germans paid, and we had no tax to pay because we were British Army. So I got myself a 170V Mercedes-Benz. We travelled around in that. And I found this rather nice hotel halfway up the hillside and when they took a set Dorian and, and Susan up in there and of course informed the the camp that I was there. So the officer whose responsibility was housing came out to see us, looked around the hotel and said, Staff, you're not staying here. You will be in a quarter very shortly. And of course, I knew what had happened. I'd found a really nice hotel and an officer cost a fortune. But all we got was a three-bedroomed with a cellar, my uh, army quarter, um, <laughs> centrally heated from a boiler in the basement, and the boiler in the basement, the fuel for that we didn't pay. The American, the German government paid for it. Well, when I was in Minden, we got back to, we got on to Minden now, uh, I was the, by that time, warrant officer, the WO2, uh, well, really running the day-to-day work of the of the centre. There was a major, but he didn't want to know about day-to-day -day work. He just left it for me to organise courses and events and so on. 40. Number 40, Army Education Centre, Minden. Uh, every year, the soldiers are supposed to do two things to make sure that they're still fit for it, and national service was not exempt. And one was that they had to run for the 100 yards with one of their friends on their back. So uh, the CSM, thinking, I've got to enjoy this, challenged us and said, uh, oh, so Major, you know that you're going to have to do it, but just because they're sergeants in natural service, they have to do it. And I said, yeah, that's all right. So, every one of my sergeants just hoit the friend on the back and ran up the track at a speed which I don't think any of the normal, normal sergeants could have kept up with. These were young men who'd just come from university. They'd been playing sports and so forth, so they were fit age, fit condition. So anyway, CSM, Tyronomides was his name. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't Greek, but the name was Greek. Uh, he said, uh, he had to get his own back, so I said, they really should do shooting as well, marksmen. See what they're like. Fair enough. So we uh, 
we went and we took part in this competition with the common soldier, if you like, of the unit, up to the rank of sergeant. Um, the end of the story is that there were three people at the head of the scoring, and they were all three of my National Service Sergeants, Education Corps Sergeants, who, during their time at university, had gone in for rifle clubs. And frankly, they just shot better than the Army did, even though the Army rifle was weird to them because it was a, a a Lee Enfield rifle which has been modified to fire two twos. So it was a, a, a strange object, but oh my. Whilst I was, I, I had joined the army for 12 years and joining for 12 years meant that you were entitled to join, to continue for 22. Whilst I was there, the powers that be decided that the Education Corps should become an All-Officer Corps. Um, just before then, I had, somebody had sent me the wink. So I went over to the office and I converted from 12 to 22. So I was now on a 22-year thing. Two or three weeks later, the call came through for you to register for uh, applying for a commission. And I said, I don't want to. I've got two children, they're both young. I'm not particularly keen on the uh, civilian schools, or on some are excellent, some aren't. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've done 11 years. Um, I want help. And they had no choice. Because it was like they wanted everyone to be commissioned, and because I couldn't be forced to take a commission, they had to uh, retire me. I did 11 years from 1951 to 1962. And after that, of course, I was... Well, I still benefited from the army, but I mean, this isn't the army story, but it, it, it pleased me no end. I went in for teacher training, trained as a teacher, uh, at the end of three years teacher training, I went uh, to uh, the appropriate office and said I'd like a job in York if possible. And they gave me a job teaching in York. And they gave me 12 years increments. So I got the same salary as if I'd been teaching civilian life for 12 years. Which made a big difference. <laughs>